local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Public Media. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Hello and welcome to the 13th season of Your Legislators here on KRWG Public Media. I'm your host, Anthony Moreno. Joining, in, joining us in studio to talk about the upcoming legislative session is District 37 Democratic State Senator Bill Souls. Senator Souls has served as a state senator since 2013, and he joins us now to talk about issues in the upcoming legislative session as well as legislation he is involved with. Senator Souls, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate being here, and what a great program you guys have put on for so many years. Well, it's a pleasure to have you back in studio. I'd like to kick things off talking about education. Um, uh, you are a retired educator and still teaching right now, so I'd really like to get your input on some of the things that have happened recently. Just days after new New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham was sworn into office, she signed an executive order eliminating park tests. Now, I'd like to get your thoughts on this executive action. She had indicated she was going to do this in her campaign, and I think she's following through on that campaign promise, if you will. Uh, I've heard from bunches of educators. I was out at Oñate High School just this morning, and lots of them are celebrating that the park text is not there. And when I was teaching students this last fall and asked them about education, what they want to change, that was one of the main things, is the test is difficult for them to take, and it's not that they don't like taking a test, but the format is hard. The results come back late. It just was not a good situation all around. And I think people in the education community are very pleased that the park test is going to be going away. Uh, we are still under the ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, that requires that we have some measure of how our students are performing in classrooms. You're talking about the federal level. The federal level, because federal education dollars are tied to that. And so when the governor signed that, what she indicated is we are looking at how to move away from and using the park test. Uh, there might be some of that movement that we'll see this spring as far as the testing, but more really putting in place for next year what all of that testing is going to look like as far as to meet the ESSA plan that we've turned in. Now, although New Mexico's graduation rates are among the lowest in the country in recent years, New Mexico has experienced the highest graduation rates that it's ever had. Um, just in December, former Governor Susana Martinez announced that New Mexico did have a 73% graduation rate in 2018. Now, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, are you a little concerned that this change is happening in the middle of a school year? Do you think that it could impact that sort of progress? I don't think it will at all, and I think the higher graduation rates are a real testament to how well our teachers are doing, not because we've had this draconian testing going on or anything of that sort. It's due to the hard dedication of all of the educators that we've got across the state. And some of the things that we've put in place as far as trying to assist teachers at doing better, I think those have been very positive. Lots of the graduation rate increase has been a result of really working on those students who were in danger of dropping out with credit recovery kinds of programs and getting them what they needed to graduate and really starting on that back when they're freshmen or sophomores. Because when somebody drops out or doesn't graduate, it really started way back when they were ninth, 10th graders and whether they were feeling successful. Now, removing the park tests without having another sort of replacement plan in, in effect. Uh, are there some concerns about that? Well, and I'm not sure when you say removing the park test, that's not what the executive order said. It said we will move away from the park test. Okay. It's more likely that next year that we will have something else in place. Uh, it could happen earlier than that, depending on what we're able to do with the federal funding and the ESSA plan and whether we can make modifications to that now or whether these are things to go into place for next year. So if you can clarify this point of view with us, this point is they're still going to be taking tests 
that were under the park testing system this year. Is that correct? I don't know. Okay. Uh, that's still some of the things to be decided. And in her executive order, that's really what she indicated is we are going to look at what it takes to move away from using the park. Um, and that may mean this testing cycle in March, April. Mm -hmm. It may mean that we're gonna th put things in place for next year where we still have time to plan all of that. That really is up in the air as the new education secretary gets sworn in and just how all of those things move in a different direction. The biggest thing is we're moving away from the very hard testing regiment that we've been using and moving more towards a student supported and learning type of a focus. Well, let's talk about the students. Um, you penned a commentary recently that really caught my eye dealing with ACEs. Now you sort of did an in-class survey with an AP psychology class. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Could you share that with our viewers? Sure, and I need to clarify, ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. It comes from a survey that was done by Kaiser Permanente about 20 years ago, and there's a 10 question ACEs survey. And it deals with whether as a child you experienced uh, food insecurity, housing insecurity, drug abuse in the family, uh, personal violence, domestic violence, uh, somebody being incarcerated, but there are 10 separate questions. And the number that pertain to you as a child is your ACEs score. Now, based off that, the national data indicates that about a third of Americans have two or more of the 10 ACEs. Teaching AP psychology, I thought this would be a good introduction into how your early childhood experience affects you in later life. So I had the students take the 10 question ACEs survey and just write anonymously on a card what their number is, how many of the 10 pertain to them. And while I tallied that, I had them watch a video about ACEs and the health effects later on in life. And some of these health effects being? Some of the health effects, if you have six or more ACEs, your life expectancy is 20 years less. If you have two or more, your chances of diabetes and coronary heart disease more than double. Um, if you have four of them, your chances of alcoholism go up by eight times. I mean, there's some really negative, severe public health consequences. And this is something that educators have really been aware of in recent years, is that correct? Or it's, hasn't been always been around? The initial research that was done on 17,000, I think, people was done 20 years ago, but it's mm. just in the last two or three years that it really has picked up that this is a public health crisis that we need to deal with. Okay, I wanna go back, yeah, to your AP class. So my plan was this would be a good way of talking about how early experiences affect you later on in life. And I started getting the results back as they're watching this video, and I recall when the video indicates that your life expectancy with six or more is 20 years less, hearing an audible you know, gasp type of thing. As I totaled up the numbers, two thirds of my students had two or more ACEs and a third of them had six or more. Wow. And so here I am having just shown them a video that their life expectancy is 20 years less and it led to a really deep discussion about, so what are we going to do about it? Instead of just starting a discussion about how it does, I'm working with some students that absolutely are affected by the adverse childhood experiences they had as children. And this is an AP class. This was an AP class. These are the kids that are doing well and seem to be functioning really, really well. And yet they still are dealing with the trauma of their early lives. And their biggest question back to me is, how come somebody hadn't done something about it? Now you're an educator, I'd imagine seeing this happen with your students in this AP class, was it difficult to kind of not get emotional? In oh, some I sense? was on the edge of tears as we then were talking about all of this and what do I tell them about, you know, what happened to them as children? You know, how do we talk about those things? And some of the key things is first I emphasized it's not your fault. You know, adults are supposed to protect you when you're as children and it's adults' responsibility and we failed at that as the adults and society. And the other main piece is that ACEs are not destiny. And so the fact that you have a high number of ACEs doesn't mean that you're doomed, 
but it means you can make life choices to be different as you're parenting with kids and also how you lead your life. The fact that you're eight times more likely to become alcoholic with four or more aces doesn't mean you're going to be an alcoholic, but it does mean you ought to be very aware and very careful if you're around alcohol as a result. And so just kind of kept emphasizing it's not your fault and it's not destiny, but it, it caused me to write that article and I'm now involved at the state level at trying to get an ACES uh, center set up, getting funding for that. And here in Las Cruces, they're already working on some things on dealing with the, the predecessors, the causes of all of the ACES and how we can deal with food insecurity, how we can deal with the abuse, how we can deal with all the pieces to try and prevent the next generation from having so many. Now, there's been a lot of reporting done on child well-being in New Mexico and really how it's ranked towards the bottom in the country. A lot of folks have called for strengthening early childhood education, and there's been some different thoughts on how to fund that. Now, you serve as chair of the Senate Education Committee. I'd like to hear your thoughts on really how to address that and how do you think it's going to be be addressed in this upcoming session? How far do you think people, our legislators are gonna get on this issue? I think it has become one of the really big issues in New Mexico. Uh, the research indicates that the best place to invest is to invest in children, invest in, er in quality early childhood education. Uh, the things I've been hearing about budgets that are coming through is there will be substantial increases in money for early childhood education, uh, increases in money for home visiting programs, in infant toddler programs, in pre-K programs, uh, more funding for K3 plus is going to move to K5 plus at low income schools and really starting to put a focus on the early childhood learning. We know if we can have kids ready for school that their likelihood of graduating, as we indicated earlier, goes way, way up. I think for the first time I'm seeing out of some of the finance committee and other places a real focus and emphasis that this is where we need to make the investments. And it's very nice this year with, and it's been widely reported, all of the additional money due to oil and gas in the state that we've got money to actually make those investments. Now we're talking about funding, but you've got to have quality teachers in the classroom to help deliver a quality education. And one of the things that really caught my eye towards the end of last year was a legislative finance committee report, progress report on teacher compensation. Now, the thing that really caught my eye on social media with this was that the report stated that half of teachers that are coming out of school within five years leave the profession that's, those numbers alone just make me take a step back as somebody who's been in the profession for so many years and been in the legislature. What are your thoughts on those striking numbers? Those are real concerns. And as we talk about trying to increase early childhood education, trying to rebuild our public education system, it starts with having high quality uh, educators in the classroom every single day and people who stick around. Um, we know that lots of the reason people leave, or the main reasons they leave in New Mexico is low pay. Uh, our teachers are on the low end of middle income. Uh, it's very difficult. We even know that some of our teachers have food insecurity, that they qualify for public assistance in several areas. And these are people that are professionals and we expect to be teaching our kids. And so this year, I think with the budget increases, there's going to be substantial increases in teacher pay so that we can pay, pay them as professionals. They also leave because the profession has been vilified as being the problem of everything in society. The morale has been very low. And so trying to rebuild that as far as to keep teachers in the profession is paying them and treating them as professionals. Where do you think the biggest need with that is? Is it starting salary, people coming out of school, or is it people just a, across from the beginning of their career to the middle of their career? And that's a great question, and the answer is yes. Both. Uh, <laughs> it's all of the above. Okay. We need higher salaries for the current teachers so that we keep the good people in the classroom and that they aren't leaving for other jobs or retiring early because they are able to. We wanna make sure that we pay them appropriately. We have to have a salary also that attracts people to want to be teachers again. Uh, this was many years ago, but I had a friend who was in engineering 
but he would talk to me regularly about teaching and he told me if teaching paid the same as engineering, he'd be a teacher in a heartbeat, but it doesn't. And so we don't have some of our very best and brightest people just because of salary. And so we need to make sure that we get them into the, the front end. So we both have to increase the pipeline on the front end and close the holes on the back end so that we rebuild our teaching core. Now, one of the other things that caught my eye with this report from the Legislative Finance Committee on um, teacher compensation was that the years of returning teachers has declined as well. Now, does that have something to do with just a generation turn with people retiring, or is that just an issue in general that's always been there? I don't, I think it's more an issue of professional respect and whether we're paying them appropriately. That people, it, education is a hard, hard job. Uh, lots of people think that you just go in there, you have your summers off, you're done at 3.30 in the afternoon. I don't know any teachers that don't take work home with them on a daily basis, that don't care deeply about their students, you know, that do it because they get their summers off. They do it because they care and doing quality lesson plans, making sure that you keep your professional development, your knowledge levels high, all of those things matter. And when you do all of that, and then you're also told that you're the reason and the problem for all the ills of society, people don't, you know, that, that's hard to, to keep the energy up for doing it. And I think we lose an awful lot of people for that reason. So is New Mexico doing a good job in preparing the next generation of teachers? Now I've seen something to where enrollment dropped dramatically in teacher preparation programs at both public and private institutions across the state. 58% from 2012 to 2016, according to this report? I believe that to be absolutely true, and it had dropped a lot prior to 2012. Uh, there are lots of plans. Uh, there's gonna be a major revamp of all of public education in the state. For the last two years, the Legislative Education Study Committee has been working on an NCSL, the National Council of State Legislators, a plan called No Time to Lose, which is how to set up world-class education systems. And New Mexico is one of two or three states that is actively moving forward. You'll see lots of those pieces start showing up in the next year or two. One of the main ones is how do you get quality teachers in and how do you keep them when they're there? Uh, right now, I don't think we do a very good job of recruiting teachers, of making sure they get through and then also supporting them in their first year or two as a teacher. We kind of just put them into a classroom and if you survive, then good luck. So do you have any thoughts on how to compensate teachers? I mean, what are your thoughts on this? How do we address this and what can we do about it? I mean, is there a specific plan that you have in place or people that you're working with? Yes, uh, there's lots of things and I think teachers will see that right away. Uh, the proposals that I'm hearing right now as far as money and financing is that we're looking at five to 10% pay increases this year and provided the money stays around of doing that again next year is really getting teachers up to a professional level of salary. Uh, we are looking at proposals to uh, do loan for service. So people who agree to stay in New Mexico when they finish their degree that will pay for the college loans that they've built up. There are several proposals to increase the number of scholarships in education so that if you go into education, your college is going to be covered. Uh, lots of programs at the two-year schools to get people into the front end of the pipeline. Uh, there are now programs at many of the high schools around New Mexico called Educators Rising, which is a high school pre-teacher program because we know if we can get people to start thinking about education, they're more likely to then become teachers. Now, of course, you gotta have a successful school as well to support quality educators. Should we incentivize teachers at struggling schools different than we should at teachers that are at successful schools? I don't know, I'd have to see more about if some proposals of that sort. What we wanna do is we wanna have all schools up to a successful level. And that means we have to have quality teachers at every school. And we know that in high income areas, the teachers are there longer, there's more parent, parental support. It's a, I'm not sure it's an easier job, but they're more likely to stay, which means we often are, have long-term subs and lesser qualified teachers at our schools where the students are most at risk. And we need to make sure every child has a quality teacher and, and is at a good school. 
and, I, and we're not going to do that by firing and punishing the poor schools. We're going to do it by giving them resources in order to, to be able to do a better job with the students. And again, the teachers are working hard. It's we as society that need to step up and ensure that the kids are getting an opportunity. Okay, well, there's plenty of issues with education that I know we continue talking about. I could talk education all day <laughs> with anyone. Uh, but I do want to move on and talk about other legislation that you're working on. Um, the Las Cruces City Council passed a resolution supporting a bill that you have been working on that has to do with establishing a special liquor license. Now, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you plan to do with this bill, and could you tell us a little bit more about this proposed special license? Yes. New Mexico has some of the most arcane liquor license laws in the country. They're very limited. They're limited. They're very limited, which means artificially the value of those has gone up because the government has artificially limited the number of licenses. They cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, hundreds of thousands just for the license to be able to sell liquor, which makes it very difficult for a restaurant to open up that has more than just a beer and wine license. And yet we know lots of people come in and they just want to have a drink before dinner and they can't do that and it makes it very difficult for those restaurants to, to stay viable. A uh, good friend owns a restaurant down in the Mesilla area and people coming off the interstate from other places and they just want to have a drink before dinner. And he says, well, I can't give you a real margarita. I can give you a wine-based margarita. And they're like, kind of a you know, strange place is this? And they leave and go elsewhere. That's hard on his business. New Mexico also has a fledgling distillery industry. I think we have about seven or eight distilleries now. Colorado has 60 some distilleries. Their biggest problem is finding market for their product. This particular bill would allow a restaurant with a beer and wine license to add distilled spirits to it, provided they are New Mexico distilled spirits. So it supports our distillery industry, it supports our local restaurants, and it's very narrowly crafted. It's an opt-in. The local government has to choose to do it and must designate specific areas for doing that. So should this bill pass, cities still need to vote on this bill? The city government would need to approve it. So if your city doesn't want to participate, you're not required to, you're not forced to. It's a local option. And this limits only for New Mexico distilleries, they would not be able to purchase out of state. You couldn't get liquor. a Jack and Coke or you know any national brand or anything of that sort, only New Mexico distilled spirits. So it supports the New Mexico industries, New Mexico tourism type of things. Critics of this proposed bill though, say that this could extremely devalue the liquor licenses that they hold. They say that it could even cause the banks to you know, make a run on their loan and, and call their loan basically and could hurt their businesses. What's your response to that? There's no evidence to that. Uh, those same businesses when they opened up the beer and wine licenses said they were going to go out of business. It would ruin their whole investment and it didn't happen. Their, the value of those licenses continued to go up. And this really is to promote promote economic development of other restaurants and communities rather than this uh, current system we have that um, has them artificially inflated and so it's not a free market system at all. So do you think this system in place right now with liquor license favors national change instead of local businesses? Um, it certainly does some because they've got the national banking to buy one of the licenses and we've seen that that it's moved away from the local businesses to yeah, the the chain restaurants that we all know that have a bar as part of them. Uh, they also have to be able to finance the value of that license, which means the cost of drinks and other things goes up in order to finance that. Uh, some people have indicated that this will promote drinking. Most of the New Mexico brands are not the low end cost. These would be relatively expensive uh, drinks that they're talking about. And they also are at a restaurant that has a real incentive to not overserve anybody. It's just so somebody could enjoy a drink with their meal and not a place where a bar where, for instance, college kids are gonna go drink to get drunk or anything, that highly unlikely to happen. Well, I mean, you brought up something promoting drinking at, at the Las Cruces City Council meeting. There was somebody who was concerned about increasing drunk drivers on the road. Do you have any concerns about that with this bill? I don't, and I actually think this would reduce some of that. Uh, we have many communities that no longer have a local restaurant with a liquor license. So they often will drive 
30 miles, 50 miles to a town that does, which means they're more likely to be driving distances back after having been drinking. Uh, again, all of the places already have trained staff that are trained to recognize uh, people that have had too much, trained servers, you know, very much a concern that this makes it more of a local uh, responsible drinking rather than in any way promoting over drinking. I mean, you, you talk about this, you know, increasing uh, economic opportunities in the state yes. for entrepreneurs and things like that. What about agriculture in the state? Do you think it could make a positive impact there as well? Certainly could. I mean, I've got dreams that uh, southern New Mexico will have fields now that are covered with agave, which is a relatively low water use crop that is then turned into some sort of a New Mexico tequila. We can't call it tequila. That can only come from that area of Mexico. But a distilled agave to grow in this area, it's a limited water use, and we could be noted for that. Uh, certainly, uh, apple brandies, the apple orchards around New Mexico, and on the east side, there's lots of grains there, and so certainly all of those could be part of it. Now, your critics obviously have a very powerful lobby in the state. There's been some attempts before with similar bills like this that have died instantly. What are your hopes for this session? Uh, the last session when we were able to, which was the last 60-day session, this bill passed out of the Senate. Uh, they, the Business and Industry Committee on the House would not hear it for more than four weeks uh, before they would even hear the bill because the lobbyists and all have very much gotten to that committee. This is not a partisan bill. Uh, there are some of the strongest supporters of this bill. Uh, Senator Ron Griggs from Alamogordo area is a strong supporter of fixing our liquor license bills. I just a couple of days ago talked with Representative uh, Montoya from the Farmington area, a Republican on the House side, about this particular bill and he's going to introduce a similar bill on the House side. So I think there's strong support all around okay. for the bill. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. However, wow, Senator that went Stoltz, fast. <laughs> it does, it always does, but I do want to thank you for joining us. Oh, it certainly, it's my pleasure. And we want to thank you for joining us for your legislators. Stay updated with legislative news anytime at krwg.org. We're on social media as well. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And you can email us your thoughts and story ideas to feedback at nmsu.edu. I'm Anthony Morano. We'll see you next time.